Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C A G F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Meet Braun. You need a woman? Nothing like a woman after a fight. He's a sword for hire who will only fight if the money is right. Meet Tyrion. Already? He's a wealthy dwarf with a big mouth. I once brought a jackass and a honeycomb into a brothel. Who just got himself into a heap of trouble. They don't like each other much. What do you want, Bron? Gold? Women? Gold and women? But they couldn't need each other more. have to get along. I'm not your toady, and I'm not your friend. Mainly interested in your facility with murder. Even if it kills them. How would you like to die? With a belly full of wine and a girl's mouth around my teeth. In a world of dire wolves and lions, sometimes the rarest creature is a friend. <laughs> I'll stand for the dwarf. your first man before you were 12. It was a woman. <laughs> she swung an axe at me. From the people who brought you the best little whorehouse in King's Landing comes one and a half man. In the Game of Thrones, they're playing as a team. Stay low. Stay low. Coming soon. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Frame Rate episode 36. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Brian Brushwood. Brian Brushwood is, is wearing a tie. You can even tell on the audio version of the show. Well, I sound stuffier than usual, don't I? I sound pompous and I sound very wealthy. I also sound like my soul is being crushed by some mega conglomerate of global intergalactic proportions. Even so, you can still tell you're wearing a tie. <laughs> Maybe that's why you can tell I'm wearing a tie because of all those things. Hey, so uh, this turned up on Scott Johnson's Extra Life. He mentioned it, and uh, I'm surprised it's only at 29,000 views. This is the, you know, those trailer mashups where they take movies and yeah, make Yeah, and meet. you know what? When we started playing this at the top of the show, I thought, oh, it's another one of the trailer mashups. Hey, it's Game of Thrones. I'll probably enjoy it. But it is so funny. Fitting, like it, the fa the the lines that were written for the television show just fit in that it, mold, and they fit so well that you're like, I found myself like three times thinking like he didn't say that. I'm like, no, well, I guess he did since I just heard it. But it, it was well done, and it's like I'm I wish there was just that little ten percent more effort of like the the audio being normalized, mm -hmm. and it's like everything's yeah, there. the announcer voice isn't quite right. I, I get what you're uh, saying. Uh, it's but close, so close, though. That is obviously done by an editor, by somebody yes, who's just really, yes, really no. good at picking the bits and fitting them together. And the other stuff, you know, he did, he did fa a passable job. No, no, it's, it's good, and, and, it's, and it's good. But uh, one bit of news, I know we talk a lot about Game of Thrones. We won't have time to talk about it later. So right off the top, Roy Dotrice is going to be in season two of Game of Thrones. Did you know that? Yeah, in. This is the guy who reads the audiobooks, right? And so you're yeah, saying he will he actually be a character. Correct. He originally was uh, going to be Grandmeister Picel in the first series, but I think he had health issues or something and wasn't oh, able to bad. do it. So now he's going to be one of the um, uh, the magicians guys, the guys who do the dragon fire that uh, that Tyrion goes to visit. One of those guys. Excellent. Pyro well, answer. That's that what they story is rather big, but it's not, not, not the big story. This just in, the big story. 
So Apple's rumored replay service caused a lot of waves. Uh, the idea being like, hey, on Apple TV, suddenly I can rent a television show and just watch it from the cloud. I don't have to download it to anything. Uh, I can download it later and I can actually watch things that I've purchased in the past. So everybody got excited like, replay is coming, replay is coming. Well, it turns out Greg Sandoval over at CNET is good at throwing wet blankets on things. Uh, he says Apple has yet to sign cloud agreements for feature films with at least four of the top six film studios, uh, according to multiple film industry sources, and therefore uh, they pretty much aren't going to be able to make Apple Replay until they get those signings. And what makes that even harder is that HBO owns the exclusive electronic distribution rights of films from three of the top six film studios. So they'd have to get HBO's rights away from them to sign three of the six, and they need four of the six. So, uh, okay, when you say they need four, four of the six, is that to, to proceed at all or to be economically viable or is that to break I think it's uh, I think it's to have enough of a selection to be viable. I don't know if it's economically viable or just to have a decent enough selection up there to, to actually launch it. But that, this is all word on the street sort of stuff. None of this is an official announcement. Right. Well, and now I bought an Apple TV, I don't know, three, four years ago. And oh, me I, too. Yeah, I, when it first came out. Yeah, exactly. And I wanted, I had this vision of what it was going to be. And it seems like, you know, with the streaming only device, it looks like they scaled down from the vision of what I wanted it to be and instead made it like a Roku type box for streaming only. Uh, so I'm a little bit out of the Apple ecosystem when it comes to set top box stuff. Why, why is it that I'm supposed to be excited about replay again? Well, the idea is really exciting to me because I've purchased TV shows through iTunes before uh, and I've moved them to external drives and things like that, but I don't have easy access to them. With this, I could just kind of pick anything I've ever bought and play it again. I'd actually be more likely to spend money on Apple knowing, oh, well, I, I'll be able to grab it out of the cloud. Whereas so right now, I'm more likely to want to buy it from Amazon because even though I can't play it on my iPad, I can grab it out of the cloud and I can play it on my Roku and I can play it on my laptop. And, and so it's, you know, it's, it's less of a worry about, oh, I got to store all these things or I lose them. Right. Uh, so I, I, I want to be able to have that cloud storage and that ability to play things like they have with iTunes coming up in iCloud where all your music is up there if you've ever purchased it from Apple like that. Well, that's the thing, and it's and this really is the new standard that we're all starting to expect out of our media. We have already gotten it with Steam and the upcoming EA Origin for your video games. We, we now have it with iTunes. We have had it for a while with a number of other services as well. Uh, and, and when I say iTunes, I'm talking about for music. But uh, this is it's becoming more and more silly that we don't have it with with video content and it's a bummer that I and again I understand that people got it they've got to slow down I'm, they're not saying no forever they're saying no for right now but if you're gonna handicap this how long until we see this service actually come on out I'd say two years oh my gosh for really? film for film I'd say two years because because of those license window issues now it looks like they've got TV already somehow but I just don't see them getting the, those movie rights very quickly, especially with HBO, backed by Time Warner, as viciously anti-Netflix, anti-Apple as they are. They're, they're going to they're gonna fight for their right to show to party. party movies and other <laughs> kinds of have movies. parties and make you buy the DVD to sit around and watch right. them. Uh, yeah, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out. I, I really don't have, uh, I'm lousy at speculation. I, I got to think, Everything keeps moving faster and faster. I don't think it'll be two years. I think I think we'll see some kind of agreement one year from now. A year is a long time in the way the space has changed on on all of this stuff. So I'm going to say one year, and then I would have thought we would have had it by now. But it's this windowing stuff that gets in the way. So that's that's why I think too. But yeah, you may be right. I think I think we both can agree it's not going to happen this fall. No, correct. I do agree with that. And Greg Sandoval also agrees, and he actually talks to people <laughs> that know these things. So. All you right. know, that's a little bit idea. Maybe one of these days we should actually get out of the studio and actually go out and investigate like gumshoe reporters, right? Yes. Well, you're dressed like a gumshoe reporter. I, I dress like I'm a guy who's got gum on his shoe. And Just I think that's throw a fedora on your hat and you're good to go. I know, I do. I need a fedora. Dateline 2011, freight rates. The adventure continues. Let's move on now to Film Foul. <laughs> Good news to both of the people who use Chrome OS. You can now play Netflix on it. Woo! 
Actually, you know what this is good, good news for? This is good news for the folks who rent the Chromebooks on Virgin Atlantic flights, or yeah, Virgin America flights, because you can rent a Chromebook now when you go onto a Virgin America flight. I but, did not know they did that. And it gives you free access to the GoGo Wireless. So now with Chrome OS supporting Netflix DRM, you could actually watch your Netflix music or movies while you're up in the air, like George that's, Clooney. That's so brilliant. And, and wow, you have nested idea upon idea upon frame rate story. I'm really impressed with that, <laughs> Tom. But uh, uh, first of all, I misread this. When it first said Chrome, Chrome support comes to Netflix, I was like, well, that's idiotic. I watch all my stuff on the Chrome browser, but I didn't realize it was the Chrome OS. Uh, and um, I, have you gotten hands on with the Chromebook? Have you played with it at all? I, yeah, we do. We have one. Uh, Eileen, when she went to cover Google I.O., uh, for all about Android, they gave everybody who attended a Chromebook. So we've got one at home. I picked it up, played with it, liked it, but never Did went back to it. Yeah. Now, and, and I guess it's it's one of those things where the space is trying to occupy, I think, is really being rapidly filled by the iPad. I think I think you either want a real computer in a in a portable format or you want a tablet device you don't want you know it seems kind of mushy middle but it is fast and it is a, a pleasant experience what what do you suppose the hang-up was on making this happen and i don't pretend to understand any of the technical wizardry behind it uh, yeah I, I, well, i'll tell you the uh, the netflix stream requires the implementation of a certain kind of drm at the operating DRM. system level i so, knew it. drm so when you That's watch netflix on your laptop os 10 is supporting that as well as the browsers. When you watch it on your phone, the reason it took so long to come to Android and the reason it hasn't come to every flavor of Android that's out there is Android needs to support the DRM at the OS level. Uh, and, and Linux, that's the, that's the reason that you, you know Netflix for Linux is such an issue. It's gotta be supported at the operating system level. So it's, it's the craziness of Netflix being required, if they wanna play in this game at all, of implementing DRM at the operating system level to prevent you from recording the stream and pirating the movies. The well, amount of piracy they're preventing by doing this is probably indistinguishable from zero. Yes, yes. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like the only way somebody would actually pirate something using the technique that they're working so hard to block would be if they did it on a dare at DEF CON. Like if they were having a contest to see what is the kludgiest way to, to pirate a movie, then they take advantage of, of this bizarre type of flaw in there. And uh, now is it a case where it's like this is a legal thing that they're stuck to? Or, or well, case it's, it's not a legal thing. It's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a reality of doing business. They have a hard enough time striking these deals to get all of the, the stuff that they want. So if they want to continue to get these deals, they have to have the DRM in place or the studios won't even talk to them. So it's one of those things where it's like, um, they're, they know, the studios know it's stupid and Netflix knows it's stupid and Chrome knows it's stupid, but there's no way that Netflix is going to go to the studios because they know the studio is going to say, I'm sorry, did you say don't plug the DRM? I thought we had this discussion. They're not going to spend any capital with the studios trying to get them to relax their idiotic no. policies regarding no, the DRM. No, they're DR going to spend all their capital trying to get a deal signed so they can stream movies. This DRM right. was one of the ways they were able to get so many deals signed in the early days is that they had it implemented from the start. Right, absolutely. No, and I if you see. remember, you couldn't watch Netflix movies on Mac for a while. When they first introduced... Netflix streaming, it was only available on Windows right at first. I did not know that. In That's fact, amazing. it wasn't available on Firefox. It was only on IE when they very first launched. Now, I do remember that actually, but I thought that was a Silverlight thing at the time because I remember... It was the DRM was... implementation oh. through Silverlight. Gotcha, 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 yeah. gotcha. Because Silverlight had the DRM built into it, so there you go. Anyway, thanks to uh, Melissa Daniels from Google who posted on Google Plus about the ability to support Netflix in the Chromebook. I hope that implies that Linux support is coming soon. Because I gotta imagine, Chromebook right? is based on the Linux. Also, uh, speaking of airlines, American Airlines rolls out in-flight entertainment on demand that lets you finish watching your movies after you've gotten off the plane. So when you say, now, first of all, okay, gotten off the plane, you're not talking about like just, uh, it says let you continue when watching after you land. And when I read that, I'm like, dude, that's like five minutes of taxiing. Why is that a good deal? <laughs> How is that a big deal? The service has gone live on 15 transcontinental wide bodies that fly New York to San Francisco or New York to LA. Uh, and essentially, they stream all of your video selections to your laptop over the in-flight GoGo -Go wireless. Uh, 
So your TV shows you can buy for 99 cents, movies for 3.99, and then you'll be able to access anything you purchase, TV or movies, 72 or 24 hours respectively. So 72 hours for TV, 24 hours for movies. Okay, so we're not even talking yeah. like you land and and if you buffered the whole thing, the windows open, you can keep watching it as you walk off the plane. We're talking about you land, you're done, you go home, you kiss your wife, you put your kids to bed, then you log into the same thing that you were in before when you're on the plane and you finish your movie or t or TV show. Yeah, exactly. I mean that's that's the that's the idea. So you you'll the funny thing is your TV shows last 72 hours because those are 30 minutes to an hour. You really need 72 hours for time to catch up. Movies, which are two or three hours, you only get to watch them for 24 hours after you rented them because they're longer. The, well, and, and so here's the thing that, um, uh, that surprises me because, I, first of all, this is a step in the right direction. The idea of building essentially little laptops in the back of all the different chairs in an airplane is idiotic and the home entertainment systems that they've been building into them is idiotic compared to uh, everyone's laptop because everybody brings their own entertainment systems when they get on these flights. And I was convinced that Southwest Airlines was going to leapfrog over all these guys by taking advantage of the fact that uh, that they don't have anything built into the back of their chairs, that they have these cheap flights and that they were rolling out Wi-Fi. I thought, this is great because all they have to do is roll out Wi-Fi. There was talk about them having Wi-Fi for $5 a flight. And in which, which that case, it's like, yeah, use your laptop, watch whatever movies you want on your iPad or whatever, and you're golden. But they have not come close to rolling this out full steam. And I'm curious to know what, how big of a rollout this is for American Airlines, because we've seen some big announcements like this, but we haven't seen, um, I, I have not seen in my flights, quite as much rollout as it sounds like. Well, they always start these things on the, on the big New York runs. So that's what's going on here. San Francisco to New York, LA to New York, that's where it starts. Right. That is fair enough. So you just need to fly New York, San Francisco more. Uh, you know what? I'll start flying to New York. And then and fly to there. San Francisco. York, San Francisco. <laughs> Why not? There you go. Solved. All right, let's check in on the summer movie draft. Very excited to see the numbers. Ladies and gentlemen. All right, my last movie played this week, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. And there I am in last place. You're not in last place. Right? Oh, my gosh. You're in last place. Yep. Still in last place. But I'll tell you what, though. Uh, Rise of the Apes. First of all, for all of your crying and fussing about Rise of the Apes, what did I keep telling you? I kept telling you, buck up, soldier. This movie's going to do all right. And sure enough, you've spent $10 on it. And in, uh, in the first, what, four days, it's made $61 million. This thing's going to top around $80, $90 million. This is going yeah, to be. Not nearly what I needed it to do. I know, I know. I needed it to do a hundred million plus. I'm telling you, you. Uh, I mean, first of all, you needed to do eight hundred million if you wanted to win this. Well, thing no, it, I wanted to get out of the basement. I'm not even going to do that now. Cowboys and Aliens stalled out at sixty nine million. The Smurfs 3D seventy eight million. Those two ruined me. I mean, Which, the Smurfs actually did about Smurfs, what I expected. Smurfs overperform or overperformed uh, yeah. Cowboys and Aliens. Yeah, I don't exactly. Know if I would have guessed that. Smurfs, Smurfs did what I expected. Uh, but Cowboys and Aliens tanked. Rise of the Apes did better than expected, but it wasn't expected to do as well, so it didn't save me. I needed it to. Con I needed it to be 90 million opening weekend. Yeah, yeah, and I, I don't think any of us thought that was gonna gonna happen. I, if I remember correctly, as soon as we finished the original draft this year, you uh, your biggest regret was Rise of the Apes. You're like, oh, Rise of the Apes. What was I doing spending my last ten bucks on that? But yeah, uh, because but, uh, I ended up not spending all hundred, and I think I felt like oh, I overbid for Planet of the Apes. I should have saved that money and got Final Destination or or even Conan. Okay, I could have so gotten now, two movies instead. Yeah, I blew it all no, on, on Apes. But, you couldn't have because, um, like, Final Destination went for what? Um, Final Destination went for nine, and Conan went for eleven. So you didn't have twenty bucks. I had fourteen left. Oh so I could have got the oh. change up, and Final Destination five. If you magically knew what they were going to go for, but tell me, would you trade now, knowing where you are right now? Would you trade Rise of the Apes for any of them? I would trade Cowboys and Aliens. Well, yeah, but that wasn't on the chopping block. Yeah. You were happy with Cowboys and yeah, Aliens. No, ten bucks for sixty-one million is is fine. I just needed it to to really. <clears throat> I'm surprised Cowboys and Aliens kind of kind of crapped out on yeah, that. Yeah, me on too. The, was it was it any good? Did you go see it? No, you, you didn't I didn't even it? go see it, and I have it. That tells you something right there. No, I still I still that one's on my list. Well, I got you, scared want, away by the Rotten Tomatoes reviews. 
You, you, isn't it isn't it terrible what an effect that has now? It really Especially is. Like it's it's the death knell for anything. Which is unfortunate because the way the Rotten Tomatoes reviews go is, is it's a percentage of positive reviews versus negative reviews, which means something lukewarm that's generally liked by everyone will, will show up as a 90, 100%. Like I remember Finding Nemo being over 90%, but then something that's polarizing, you're either going to love it or hate it, will show up unfairly low. Like I remember when it first came out, Fight Club was like at 65%, and that's easily one of the best movies of yeah. 1999 if not the best movie of 1999. And then later, it, it, you know, more reviews came out and it bumped up closer to 80%. But uh, uh, have, have you been watching any movies lately? Uh, have I been watching movies lately? Yeah, what are you well, watching? Yeah, no, I, I want to get into that. But before we do, I want to point out, uh, this week is Conan the Barbarian and Spy Kids 4 with 4D smell of vision something or other. Mm -hmm. uh, Cargill has Conan the Barbarian. Jason has Spy Kids 4. And then the week after that, Final Destination 5. And that's it. Summer movie draft is over. When, when is the cutoff for counting, yeah. Yeah. counting the dollars earned? Is that at the end of this month? I Basically, think so, so these last few mo uh, movies only get a couple of weeks. Is that right? I, I, well, I think we had talked about it being like September 15th. Like okay. we wanted that to factor in that the movies near the end of the run would have a shorter amount of time. So you had to sort of factor that into your price. Sure. I can't believe it. I'm, I'm looking very good to end up second place. I mean, Cargill yeah. could catch me, but he's got to make up $117 million. Just to overtake me, just I think he could do it though. Conan will do okay, and Final Destination Five, I think he'll do really well. Oh, he's got both of those. Yeah, yeah. there's a good chance I'll be in third place. Man, uh, in the early projections with the Hollywood Stock Exchange, Cargill was pegged for last place for a while, and you were pegged. There was a time you and I were were fighting for second. Like yeah. like it was like, like you would get second place, and I would get third place. That's awesome to see how wrong. I like the fact. I would start to say like, well, the problem was I wasn't as familiar with the, uh, the, the, you know, the strategy of bidding, and I, I should have spent all hundred of my bucks. But Sarah Lane spent ninety-seven of her hundred, only one more than I did, and she's going to win this thing. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. And then win it, win it handily. That's yes. that's dang sure. But exactly. uh, uh, yeah. So talking about the movies, can we talk about what we saw? Because I yeah. Saw some so because we, we both saw Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and I. Loved it. I, you know what? I did not think I was going to use the capital L word. I, I really like is also the L word, <laughs> but I did not just like it. I loved it. I mean, also I was lesbian is an L which word. is which is which is I lesbianed it, man. It was amazing. It's like it was a same sex relationship. No, the uh, uh, here's what's amazing. This movie had so many challenges laid out in that it was a familiar story. You knew how it was going to end at the beginning. Um, and uh, there, there were virtually no no curveballs they could throw you. Plus, the previews gave away all the major plot points. Having said that, even with that being the case, it was it was an absolute triumph of character animation and storytelling because I believed and was fascinated by the relationship between the apes. I loved like, and of course, there are a couple of cheesy moments where they're where they give nods to the original Planet of the Apes series, but even then... Oh, yeah, Malfoy got the two big lines. The, yes. guy, the, the kid who plays Draco Malfoy was one of I the attendants. I did not realize that was Malfoy. He got to That's say, clear. it's a madhouse, it's a madhouse, and get your hands off me, you damn dirty ape. Yeah, well, but, but and in that scene, spoiler alert, mild, we'll keep it around blue here, but, but the moment they do that throwaway line, like, you're supposed to, like, you could tell they timed it, so mid-laugh at that line... You suddenly are like, ah! you know what I mean? Well, and that was smart because it's a madhouse. Not as many people know that line, and it, right. and it fit really well. He's you know he's kind of backing out of the of all the cages and everything. It wasn't hitting you over the head. Get your hands off me is such an iconic line. Mm -hmm. Of course, and it, it's actually number sixty on the top one hundred movie lines of all time. Did you notice some of the more subtle references to the original series? For example, the fact that Caesar is at one point doing a puzzle that's made up of pieces of the Statue of Liberty. Did you see that? I didn't notice that it was made up of Statue of Liberty pieces. That, He's a I, of, that slipped of, by me. This puzzle. He's assembling this model of the Statue of Liberty. Oh, no, and the Lego one, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I thought you meant the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, I did notice that one. You're right. Yeah, and, so, uh, and then there's also... Um, I didn't realize it. 
like I'm such an idiot, uh, and and maybe uh, these are still mild, mild spoilers. I didn't realize it at the time. I thought they were just kind of giving a nod to the fact that um, that that this is taking place in the not too distant future. And in the not too distant future, where are astronauts going to go? They're going to be going to Mars. So in the background, you hear a news story uh, say something about you know the first man thing to Mars. And I'm like, oh, that's great. They're setting it in the near future. And that's the kind of thing that'll happen in the near future. But then later in the movie, you see for like two seconds, they throw down a newspaper and it just has the headline lost in space question mark. And it shows three astronauts. And it was not until the drive home that I was like, son of a bitch. They are setting up the original Planet of the Apes with those. Well, they're three setting up the Marky Mark re reboot because he was it's on his way to Mars when he got lost. Oh, wait, what was he on his way to Mars? I believe so. Uh, but I because, thought there was because like, Charlton Heston was not. Charlton Heston was on a deep space mission of some sort. Yeah, but I thought that's what it was for the reboot as well. For the reboot, Marky Mark, Mark Wahlberg was was headed to uh, was headed to Mars and got off course. Oh, okay. Well, then then, then that is what it is. Because I always but, uh, thought it made more sense in the original with Charlton Heston. It's like, well, of course there was relativistic effects. He was on a deep space mission. You know, of course he didn't know where he was. Spoiler right. alert: Yellow. <laughs> Spoiled. I mean, really, if you've never seen that scene, the most <laughs> iconic Planet of the Apes scene, you shouldn't be listening uh, okay, to any Okay, so in the chat room, newer guy wants to know if he should see the original movie before watching the remake of, of or, or this Rise of the Planet of the Apes. I say no. No, but not for Rise, not at all. No. All you need to know is Different that, universe. You know, this is the birth of what will become a Planet of the Apes. And I even loved the little thing they did during the credits when all of a sudden it was like that was the last missing piece of the whole thing. During the credits, they don't even say anything. It's subtle and it tells a whole story. And I'm like, that's what completes the rest of the story. They for me. very so carefully said, we may not get money for a sequel. So here's what happens next. But we're not yes. going to give too much away in case we do get funded for a sequel. Well, it, it's super subtle, super... Uh, That's the way yeah. I interpreted it, though, was like, well, this, well, this will wrap itself up if we never make another movie, but we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot, so we're going to leave this it open that we can, we can make, you know, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes or... Right. Yeah. Well, well it's, it, it, what it does is, is you, there are two big questions of how. They, how do you get from our planet to a planet of the apes? And one is, okay, how do the apes become smart? That's the first one. And they spend the whole movie working on that question. The second question is, and why are humans, you know, not fighting back or gone or, or subservient or whatever happens? And that's the question that gets answered during the credits with not a single word spoken, nothing but visual imagery. Uh, that's what I really dug. You know, the one thing I really did not like about this movie was the uh, geographical lies as a <laughs> resident of the Bay Area. <laughs> the that. zoo is not in the north side of town. Uh, you, know, you can't well, not get from San Bruno to Twin Peaks that fast. I'm sorry. You know what? What's funny is, is San Bruno's where I always stay out at the airport. And I'm like, they do not have a primate holding facility in San Bruno. What is this? But it's like, I'm finally that jerk who, who knows something about San Francisco. But you know what was funny is, for all of that, and you're used to that, right? Anybody who's lived in Austin like Brian and seen the movie Slacker has had that effect a million times during that movie. They'd turn a corner on the other side of town. But uh, the things that they did get right i thought was pretty cool like uh there was some south bay stuff that they got right some of the timing that it would take for the apes because they they go on this run uh seemed right muir woods is north of san francisco where it's supposed to be uh, it's, and it's even the close. scene that they shot and i think they actually shot it on the golden gate bridge uh, the little pylons that they use to change the lanes, because the way the Golden Gate Bridge works, if you don't know, they can make the six lanes be four one way to the other or four one way to the other, depending on the commute traffic. Right. Some of those little yellow cones were still there. Some had been knocked over. And if you've ever drove in the Golden Gate Bridge much, you've noticed that like every once in a while one's flattened because somebody kind of weaved over in their lane. And I was like, wow, they could have, when they were shooting this, just taken them all out. But they decided to leave a couple and it, and it made it look real to me okay so here's the part where i can't believe i'm saying these words and if we were doing a summer movie draft of movies that brian would like this is not how i thought i would say everything at the end but i cannot think of a movie that came out this summer that i liked more or that i thought was better executed than rise of the apes Can wait a you? minute brian are you saying 
If you saw only one movie this summer, <laughs> see Rise of the Planet of the Apes. I can see I think the chat room's going to take like five seconds. They'll have a trailer out. They're like, if you see one movie this summer, <laughs> make it Rise of the Planet of the Apes. But uh, uh, seriously, can you think of any other movie that was that was quite as as well executed as as engaging? Because um, that's. Well, you know what, the, the CG, I mean, this is a lot of CG because they got to make these apes look uh, intelligent. Incredible. Really well done for CG. You do not see the pixels nearly as much as you might expect. Just looking back on this stuff, um, Super 8 was well executed. I didn't love the story, but it was well executed. Um, Harry Potter and Deathly Hallows, actually, part two, was fantastic. Well, yes, okay, that, I, uh, you know what? Those, I, those three would be the only ones I'd even mention in the same breath, to be honest. Yeah, I'm going to well, say... Well, and from. Well, and from, for, for different reasons. I mean, obviously, what Rise of the Planet of the Apes is doing is going to be fundamentally different from what Harry Potter is doing. You know, they're obviously playing large-scale spectacle, larger-than-life battles, and it's the culmination of an eight-movie arc. But uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, I think, is... it's it's. It's so it so surprised me by how engaging a character they made Caesar. I mean, it was some. I mean, extended like we're talking ten minutes straight of no no words spoken, no dialogue, and yet only physical emotion communicated between multiple beasts was. Uh, I highly recommend it. I really liked it. I think it's. I think it's the. It will. It's a bummer that it will not really get its due, but this is the hidden gem of the summer. This is the one thing that came out of nowhere and really blew me away. I liked it a lot. And then you also finally got around to watching The Social Network. What'd you think? Finally. Well, I had, part of the reason I never did at first was because I had read The Accidental Billionaires and I was familiar with the story, but it, but finally I got around to uh, to watching the movie. And my only, the, the movie pretty much follows the book. And of course they, you know, the book admits they conduct condensed characters and situations. Uh, and it's really interesting to watch them vacillate back and forth between who's the bigger jerk uh, of all the different characters on stage. Uh, the only, the only, my only comment about the movie was I, I was surprised that I, I thought Trent Reznor's soundtrack didn't belong in the movie. It, it, it's the one thing that just took me really? out of it. Oh, see, that didn't bother me at all. Yeah, no, it just, it just like, it's, maybe, maybe I made the mistake of noticing that he was the one who did the music. And every time I heard it, it I was like, wow, that sounds very Trent Reznor. And uh, I, I, I don't know. That's yeah, it's a minor complaint. Well, I'm very excited about our winter movie draft. Uh, I was already looking over. Dan has created the, uh, the spreadsheet. Uh, thanks, Dan. And uh, yeah, Dark Wizard Dan Dirk's putting that together for us. It's, uh, uh, there's, some, there's some gems. You're going to want to get the Twilight Saga, Breaking Dawn Part 1. I'm telling you, that's going to be a, a big money maker. Outside of that, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo's got a lot of hype around it. Probably things like The Muppets, Alvin and the Chipmunks are going to do well as you know kids' movies. And I was, I was having this discussion with Eileen whether Paranormal Activity 3 will do well or it will continue the kind of like sequels don't do as well as the earlier ones and, and do less well because of that. Uh, yeah, one, one more comment. Uh, well, two things. First of all, on the winter draft, that'll be interesting because it's a much shorter season. And I don't know if we'll have the same number of players or not, but I expect that the economics are going to change. And be uh, that'll be an interesting twist on the whole game. And second of all, in the chat room, somebody was complaining that he thought that the score, Trent Reznor's score for The Social Network, was one of the best of the, of the year. Certainly, it was good. I just didn't find it a match to the story they were telling. It seemed weirdly darker than, than the story itself was. Well, the, the story itself is darker than the actual story. Maybe that's, well, that's bothering you, too. Maybe there, maybe there is that too. Maybe that's you know because they they did sort of present it in a particular kind of feel, and all of a sudden you have that dark Trent Reznor music. But all right, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor Netflix. Without which we will not be able to do any more stories on this show. No more stories. It's a new <laughs> segment we call No More Stories on Frame Rate Ever Again, unless you go to Netflix.com/slash/twit and sign up for a free 30-day trial. Now here's the thing, you know about Netflix because you're watching Frame Rate. Nobody watches Frame Rate hasn't tried Netflix. And if you are watching or listening to Frame Rate and you haven't tried Netflix, shame on you. You should at least know what it's like. So head on over to Netflix.com slash twit and sign up for a free 30-day trial and then quit. It's that easy. But here's the other thing is you, a bunch of you guys already have it and you love it. 
why are you not telling your friends? And of course you are telling your friends because everyone who has Netflix is telling their friends about the fact that you get, you know, you sign up, you get movies in one business day if you like physical media, if you get thousands of titles free on it or on instant streaming for your Xbox, your Wii, your PS3, your iPad, your iPhone, any kind of mobile device. And, uh, but the thing is, when you say you got to try it out, don't say check out Netflix. Say, by the way, do me a solid and head on over to netflix.com slash twit. Then that's what gets us the credit and keeps us in business. Then we can have more stories. Thanks to Vince for signing up for TV shows and movies streaming in unlimited amounts to his television, his laptop, and his phone at netflix.com slash twit. So we can do tube tops. Cablevision's got an app. Cablevision's Optimum app hits 2.0, brings cable TV streaming to the iPhone and the iPod Touch. So, it, now this is like a two-in-one thing. Not only is it streaming, if you're around the house, now we already have this, I know Time Warner has that for the, for the iPad where you can watch certain channels around the house, but I like the fact that it looks like it also has remote control functionality as well, right? Yeah, this is one thing that the DirecTV app has, although the DirecTV app doesn't have the ability to stream videos. You can schedule things to record on your DVR. You can change channels from the iPad, which is pretty cool. So Cablevision's packing all of that together in one thing. You can schedule DVR recordings. You can... You you can change the channels, and you can you can uh, you can watch you can watch streaming television shows as well, but only in your house on your yeah. Cablevision approved internet mode. Baby steps, baby steps, Tom. Just just one little bit at a time. We can't we can't leap all the way to everything willy nilly right now. But I'll tell you what, I, I'm in favor of this, and I would like to see all people totally revamp the way we think of the DVR interface. Do you realize that? For all of season four of Breaking Bad, when I set my DVR to record Breaking Bad, I accidentally selected the non-HD channel of AMC. And uh, the very interface of the Time Warner DVR interface is so slow, so Byzantine, and so frustrating that I, every time I'm like, ah, oh, it's not in high def and it looks stupid. I'm like, oh, well. And then I just keep watching it. Like, I, I long for a beautiful interface for a DVR. I just want to go back to my TiVo from 1999. And it's like, it's amazing to me how kludgy all of them are to this date. So I'm hoping that bringing in other devices, you got people, they're finally diverting programmers to having them make controls for the iPhone and the iPad and Android apps. I'm hoping that, that they'll, um, uh, that maybe they'll dust off some of the other features on the DVRs as well. So you cannot shut up about Nick. <laughs> Nick? Nick? Me? At night. Uh, Nick, and there's a uh, story here from New York Mag that Nick's new 90s nostalgia block is a rating smash. Yeah, this is all those old Nickelodeon shows that a lot of the 20-somethings grew up with, the kids of the 90s, stuff like um, uh, all that, Keenan and Kel, um, Clarissa explains it all, etc. Now, he, the reason I wanted to talk about this is they're not kidding. When it, when it says uh, is a rating smash, I read that and I'm like, I'm like, well, what does that mean, a rating smash? This is the same channel, same time slot. When it was Malcolm in the Middle, they drew 33,000 folks under 34. Same time, Monday night, episode of All That brought in 265,000 viewers for a rerun. It's like they, um, uh, li likewise, Undeclared brought 3,000 people from 18 to 34 when it aired at 1 a.m., but Clarissa attracted 189,000 people in the same demographic 60 times as much, 6,000%. But don't you think that's just brief nostalgia? That can't sustain those numbers. People, people are tuning around. They see the show like, ah, I remember this. They watch it for a little while, and then it's going to fall off. They're not going to keep well, this watching. Is, this is what I wanted to discuss is I, I suspect there's a sweet spot for nostalgia. And part of the thing, it has to be the right, you have to let the nostalgia age for a while. And you also have to refuse access to it long enough to where finally when you get it back, it, it just feels so good. It's like putting on some old clothes. You get really excited about it all over again. It used to be back when it would take a long time for a television show to get enough episodes to, I think you had to hit 100 episodes in order to qualify for syndication. That was a long time that you didn't get to see the show and then the floodgates opened and you got to enjoy it. Now these are, you know, these would be shows that are four or five years, four or five years in production at the time. But, but I think by holding it a little bit longer, uh, I don't know. I think they're discovering the science of how to 
derive the maximum nostalgia benefit, and I disagree. I think people will be watching this for a while. In There's fact, no story oh. arc, though. If I get sucked into an old show like that has a story arc, I'll keep watching it because I'll get stuck into that story arc. But these are just one-offs, and after a while, you're like, okay, yeah, that was fun. But I'm not going to keep watching this for months and months and months. You're an old man. Right now, there's some 26-year-old who's just like, Barrett, I don't even know you anymore, Dad. What's going on? You used to be cool. Now you're telling me I can't watch Keenan and Kel anymore? No, I'm saying you'll watch it, but you won't keep watching it. I don't care what you say you you're going to do. You're not you going to watch it for more than two months. No, uh, you know what? Ice Cream in the chat room already says, that's me, Scam School Brian. He Ice says, Cream, two months from now, tell me if you're still watching it. All right, yeah, we'll do a follow-up because it will be interesting. Because Also... You're, you're, it get off my lawn. That this is a temporary bump. Stay away from my azaleas. <laughs> Stop with your jazz music. Speaking of old man comments, J.J. Abrams was uh, interviewing with The Guardian, uh, and he said, quote, For years I had people praising Lost to death, and now they say, quote, I'm so pissed at you for the end of Lost. I think a lot of people who were upset with the ending were just upset that it ended, and I've not yet heard the pitch of what the ending should have been. I've just heard that sucked. So io9 said, fine, we have said the way it should end, and we are going to come up with another list of five things, that five ways we think it should have ended, and they invited their, uh, their readers to do the same. All right, well, okay, first of all, a couple of things. Number one, you're absolutely correct. J.J. Abrams does come across as a grumpy old man saying, oh, yeah, what would you have done? Jerky jerk, herky jerk. Let's, you know, not realizing that that was all of the Internet he was pushing. And if there's one person you shouldn't ask, how would you have done it? It's the Internet. Uh, second of all, io9's list of fixes is really just a thinly veiled bunch of gripes about stuff they didn't see. And it's like, that's not well, fixing. Really? That's no, I thought some of these sounded pretty good. Well, I mean, for example, suggestion number one here, uh, show us what happens when the man in black gets off the island. That's not a solution. That, that's a complaint about something you wish you, you could have seen. Sure. That no, that's, that's fair. I, I like number two, raise the stakes. Uh, the, the, you know, they say that the threat is that the man in black is going to destroy the island. Uh, Rewatching the finale, it's amazing how low on incident it is, and I think that's true. They should have raised the stakes more in that finale. Like there should have been, there should have been more threat, and it was a lot of just, well, we got to tromp around and stop stuff. And number four, show us what Jacks learned over six seasons. That could have been a great finale if they'd really focused on the redemption of Jack, and instead that kind of sputtered out. Yes, uh, I can see that. Although I don't know, I thought for the most part it was. I thought they did. It was clear, maybe they didn't like the execution of it, but I thought there was a reasonable expression of the redemption of Jack. I, 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 I say all this being one of the people who liked the ending of Lost. I enjoyed I watching it at the time because I felt it was a celebration of the show. But I can see where people are saying, yeah, but I wanted more story conclusion and less feel conclusion and i felt like oh i got i got a little a little taste of everything and you know it was it was a nice tribute episode but there could have been a more compelling story i do agree with that yeah and and keep in mind man if there's of all the having to juggle fans of different varieties and and make the suits happy i mean can you imagine the pressure and how many compromises they had to go through from the budget of what they wanted to show but didn't have the budget to do to to the way they wanted to do the story to the amount of you know pressure from the studios you get i do not envy jj abrams position on this and i agree with you i thought for the most part he acquitted himself pretty well with the way everything got wrapped up speaking of jj abrams you've been watching fringe and I, I didn't put this in the lineup, but producer J.H. Wyman told io9, the show has a meaning to us that we haven't shared yet. We feel confident that that meaning is going to get across. And, he, and he implies that we're going to see it in this coming season. Oops. So... Wrong. Well, let's not move on to interfere on No, 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 I got the screen. <laughs> no, actually, I, I'd like to think that what he was doing is he was playing mysterious music to go in. <laughs> <laughs> and it no. just happened. So, <laughs> how far into Fringe are you and how are you feeling about it? I'm still, I'm, I'm unfortunately snails pacing it, and that's just because after being on vacation for like three of the last four weeks, I'm, I'm doing a lot of work and I'm not watching as much stuff as I'd like to, but uh, I'm hoping to ramp up tomorrow. I'm going to do a marathon and watch like six of them straight through. All right. And you're caught up on Breaking Bad? Yes. How are you? I am. I, we, this Sunday was the first Sunday where we actually had waited a week between episodes. And what was weird is like, 
we both realized, oh, we have a Breaking Bad to watch. There's more to watch. It, you know, yeah. it, was, it, it was last week, it was like, oh, crap, we have to wait a week. And it was almost like we forgot because we got out of the habit of watching three or four in a row. And it was this special treat to be like, oh, we get to sit down and see what's up with Walt. So did it kill the momentum to have to go week to week? Because I remember there's been a lot of shows. Lost was one where it's like I full-on stopped watching because I couldn't handle it week to week. And then I watched it all straight through again. And then I stopped again because I couldn't handle watching it week to week again. Are you, are you okay with it week to week the way it is now? This week, we, this week I was because of that. We'll see next week if I'm like, wait, where were we? What's going on? But this week it just felt like I was back in the flow. And I, you know, I, I know these characters. I know what they've been up to. There was, there was no gap there. Um, right. You also... Uh, watching the regular show still regularly uh oh my gosh i'll tell you what man nothing brings a father and his seven-year-old daughter together like watching two complete slacker jerks refuse to do their duty like i can i'm aware like i'm like i should be upset that this show that celebrates people not doing the job they're paid to do is on this children's network teaching bad attitudes to my daughter but that was funny right there that's the funny part right there. this past week i caught up on warehouse 13 uh which is in its fourth season and i still like that show my opinion has not changed it's not a great show i don't even really recommend it to people, uh, you know, it's not one of those shows where I'm out like you've got to watch. Where you know, it's like, hey, watch it if you like it. You like it. It's 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 fun for me, and it's one of Sci-Fi's highest rated shows. And I think maybe it's the kind of the Jack Johnson effect, where it's like, eh, it's just kind of mellow and inoffensive, and you end up watching it, and you're like, oh, that was nice, you know. And you don't have a strong opinion one way or another, but you just keep watching it. Uh, I also caught up on Falling Skies, which had their season finale on Sunday, and that show really got good at the end with some Spielberg awfulness at certain points that just made me want to vomit at certain scenes. So it's kind of a mixed opinion. But overall, I thought that story peaked well, and I'm definitely into watching the next season. Awesome. Awesome. Now oh, and uh, Eureka uh, got canceled. What? Yeah, Eureka on Sci-Fi. They announced they're going to do one more season what? after this season. Hold on, what is it? What is this? You don't put it in the dock. You don't mention it. We do our whole two tops experience, and then you're like, BT Dubs, Eureka's well, because out. Well, because it didn't get, like, it's chopped off, and that's it after the season. Like, they, they, it's one of those things where, like, we're going to give it one more season, and then then we're phasing it out. So it's, you know, it's a gentle goodbye. They're giving everybody plenty of notice. They're giving the writers a chance to wrap up the story. So they're, you know, it's six seven years it's 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 okay it's like when grandpa's like 95 and can't remember who you are <laughs> that's a, that's that's uh that's the other summer movie quote I want actually to see. that's the simpsons eureka it's when the like simpsons we, gets canceled everybody's gonna be like it was time he lived a <laughs> long life yes. sometimes cancellation is a blessing yeah he's simpsons are happier now where they've gone to no, wait a minute. Simpsons haven't been canceled. No, no, like, that's what I mean. They've been on for how many, uh, 60 years now? I mean, Jesus. No, they're still rocking. They're still rocking for sure. All right, let's finally move on to Interfair. That baby monkey thing. You know, the, the Alamo Draft House, of course, they don't show advertisements when you walk in for the pre-show. Instead, they show awesome videos that are just related to whatever movie you see. So they showed a bunch of, for, for Rise of the Apes, they showed the old cartoon for Planet of the Apes. They showed um, some weird ape-related videos. Uh, then they, but then they also just randomly showed Baby Monkey riding on a pig, and I was shocked at how many people in the theater weren't already hip to that video. It was clear they were hearing it for the very first time. That's awesome. Being able to see people experience Baby Monkey for the first time. It's not pure to be missed. joy injected to your eyeballs. <laughs> All right, real quickly, a uh, piece of news before we get to some cool web videos. MovieClips.com is bringing their clip library to YouTube. Uh, that's the largest collection of licensed Hollywood film clips on the web, 20,000 HD clips. So you'll be able to go and watch those famous moments legally. Now, okay, so here's my question to you, and this is the reason I wanted to, we were talking about clipping this for time, but... Uh, Pat clip, is, get it. Is this, is this, I didn't know if you'd point that out, thank you. Uh, is this something we should be excited about that, in that, let's face it, one of the number one things I use YouTube for is, oh, you don't remember that scene with the Big Lebowski when he says this? And you'll just type in the line from the scene, and it's always there, right? It, on the one hand, I'm happy to see some legitimate form of that coming to you know to, to YouTube, but on the other hand, it means that it leaves the curation about what is and isn't a valid clip that you're allowed to watch to impress your friends 
uh, to the studios. And that part makes me less, I mean, I understand why they're doing it. And of course, from the studio's standpoint, they'd love to have complete control of everything. But I can't decide if I'm happy or upset that they're doing this. What's your take Well, on there's it? a couple of things that's, that's good about this. One, uh, because of this, there'll be official data points. This won't be, you know, me in my bedroom uploading a clip from Planet of the Apes with Charlton Heston and putting really crappy meta tags in because I'm in a hurry. Uh, right. This will be, like, solidly searchable by what they said, what actors are in them, what genre, what era. So it'll be easier to find stuff. And the other thing is, a lot of the clips that are up there right now are approved by the studios because of the YouTube policy that says, if you find an infringement video you can claim it and then you make the revenue off of the stuff there so it's not like they're driving things out they're just expanding what's actually available on YouTube so I think mostly it's a good thing oh well then that that is good I didn't realize that there would be an alter what I didn't want to see was a future where they started policing anyone who grabbed a clip that wasn't one of their sanctioned clips to put up there but if that's no, not I the mean case, it's not gonna I mean they already do that so it's not, it's not going to change that. It's not going to make it any better or any worse. But it is going to add more videos and probably higher quality videos as well. Yeah. All right. So I, I found this next uh, clip. And Jason, we can go ahead and kind of roll it while I talk here. On Engadget, uh, this is made with a Nokia N8. Uh, it is the, quote, world's largest stop motion movie filmed on a beach in South Wales using... Uh, the phone's 12 megapixel sen sensor. It was actually done on three different phones, they had, but they had one up on a crane, uh, and they just did stop motion from above with uh, of a boat floating on the water with fish and a, and a fisherman. Wow. And the, the, guy, the fisherman guy is actually laying down on the beach, but it totally so, looks so, like okay, he's standing just, in the just boat. Just to get an idea for the scale, to get an idea of the scale, that fisherman is an actual man dressed as a fisherman. Right exactly. Now. That is amazing. That is really interesting. And it's it's this life is, size. On phone? And the, you can see it does. It gets wider and wider. The largest scene spans over 11,000 square feet in this thing. That's fantastic. I don't know what we're looking at now. Wait. It's a continuation. Wait, this is at night? Yeah, yeah. Because the, the fish eats him, and then he goes into the belly of the whale and gets spit back up. So that's, that's when you have, when well, they had three different phones. They had, they had, they had, it's not one continuous shot. Right, because it's stop motion, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> it's not one continuous. <laughs> uh, and so, and I guess they just used the actual tide coming in. Boy, think about that. They had to time everything and actually time it with the actual tide arriving. That's, I think that's very cool. And then uh, finally, uh, this was made by what? Collegehumor.com? College think. Humor, yeah. It's a collegehumor.com exclusive. They're doing animations, shorts, and I would love to see a making of, of this, but maybe it's already there. Uh, it's a, it's a, if Game of Thrones was a 16-bit RPG, hearkening back to the Super NES days, um, we should warn extremely high spoiler yeah, content. Explo uh, spoiler alert red, if you will, Mr. Howell, yeah. uh, because this is... Spoiler alert. Okay. And in fact, All we right. should probably just watch the first uh, the first two two and a half segments are really as they're, they're relatively safe because they all occur in the first two episodes here. So they, this is just the opening scene, but this is actually one of my favorite parts. Yeah, because it really feels like the opening to a 16-bit game. I mean, is there software? Do you think somebody ate this? Oh, I, I'm sure you could code this fairly easily these days. So the, the first scene is obviously the scene of Jamie and Cersei discovered by Bran. And you get menus that you can choose what to do. It, it's very clearly, it's very clearly modeled on a uh, And in fact, when the victory occurs here, you're going to hear a copyright-free version of the Final Fantasy Victory song here. Anyway, the whole thing is filled with a whole bunch of spoilers. They got this one. Um, and it's uh, obviously done by people who love the story because they're so hilarious in, in the jokes that they made. And uh, it's very yeah, it's, dirty. It's not safe yeah. for work. Yeah. Well, thank goodness <laughs> As we're not is the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling you it was not safe for work, Jason. 
There we go. There we go. So that'll come out. That'll come out of the. Not later because version. I just was musing. I wasn't sure we You're wanted like, to no, show that. Seriously, Jason, it's not safe for work. Was it? And Jason's just vegged out like, man, this is really funny. I'm just gonna keep watching this, boss. <laughs> I'm like, you're right. That is not safe for work. Wow. Somebody should switch away from that. Oh wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now it's time for feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio, yeah. This first one comes from Chuck Byers. Guys, could I get your take on the fact that most of the DVDs coming from Netflix now don't have scene selection menus? I know both of you are in the 23rd century and don't get physical media anymore, but my wife and I still like to watch movies that are not yet on streaming and sometimes both fall asleep and have to go back and rewatch the second half of the flick that we snooze through. Just wanted to get your take on this. Thanks, Chuck Byers. Uh, I would say for me, the, the re your experience when you get a movie from Netflix is with the intention of watching the movie once and then sending it back. And I think it's okay that that disc have a fundamentally different experience from a DVD that you purchase. And if anything, I think that increases the value of a purchased DVD, one that belongs in your library that you want to pull off from time to time to rewatch certain scenes or to, you know, try to listen to the director commentary and all that stuff. I'm actually 100% okay with that. What yeah, about you? yeah, that's why, uh, you know, we should have DRM on streaming videos and downloads because it increases the value of that DVD when you purchase it. Oh! All right, well played, sir. <laughs> So you don't like this? <laughs> no, I don't like this. That's that's stupid. Chat, not giving me the special features because I'm only renting. That's fine, right? But taking away the fundamental fu uh, function of a DVD, which is to have chapters, taking chapter marks out, crippling the product. That doesn't make any sense it's not to me. Not crippling the product. All it's doing is it's changing the. You know what? It's what I don't like those menu se selection things. Even when I own the disc, it's just one more stupid menu you have to sit through. I just end up fast forwarding through the movie. To to get where I want anyway. So you don't want chapters. You not you 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 never chapters, want to skip through no, the, to the chapters. You know what, Tom? Strangely, I don't love that three and a half awkward seconds of waiting for the first chapter menu to show up, and then having this like next page and waiting another three and a half awkward seconds for the next one to show up, and then deciding, oh wait, maybe it was on the first one, and then going back and doing it all over again, and then ending up just fast forwarding it through anyway. If you were asking me how I want to do it, I want to open it in Win VLC and drag my mouse pointer up and down until I find the part that I want. So That's essentially, I, you're telling Chuck, shut up and quit whining. You just watch it in VLC. You can move around real fast. <laughs> just download it from BitTorrent. You can do whatever you want. Oh, God, I'm not saying that. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> uh, you know, actually, my first impression when I read Chuck's, uh, Chuck's email here was to get the song Physical by Olivia Newton-John stuck in my head. Because <laughs> he says, don't get physical. Media. <laughs> And because you apparently still live in 1984. I do. You That's would remember my address. This. Shorty writes in, says, Hey, Brian and Tom, last week Tom said there was no good free open source video tools. I would beg to differ. There are Lightworks for video editing. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. okay. And Blender for 3D. I did say there were some good 3D tools, and Blender is a good call. That, that's a good one, Shorty. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, it is Windows only. It was used Lightworks to cut the King's Speech, which did win an Oscar. And then there's Blender. It is multi platform. I don't have any Hollywood examples, uh, but check out Sintel, which was made with Blender. People that worked on it have been hired to Pixar, DreamWorks, and Disney. No, totally right, Shorty. I should have mentioned Blender. Uh, I'll check out Lightworks, though, and, and, and see what I think. I, I, yeah, tell you what, I had not heard that uh, the King's speech was cut with that. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's uh, that that's an interesting one. Um, and and they have a congratulations to Tariq Anwar on their uh, on their page. Is it in fact open source though? It says Lightworks public beta. That implies uh, to me uh, that they just give a free version away for folks to work. But it also says the Lightworks open source project starts here. Uh, we announced plans in April 2010 to take Lightworks open source. We always said the first step would be to make the application freely available to a large community. So it looks like they haven't taken it open source yet, maybe? I don't know. I but don't know, it, but I will but say... Yeah, at least they're headed in the right direction. So thanks, Shorty. You know, that's good stuff. Thanks. I will say that before we read this next letter, we already got to go to spoiler alert blue because it's got a first episode spoiler in it. But uh, Matt Mayer to us says, Hi, Brian and Tom. I need some help in order to You've stop... You've got to wait for the spoiler alert man to say it's a spoiler. Otherwise, people could get spoiled. 
Okay, fine. I need some help in order to start watching Breaking Bad again. See, I started watching a couple of years ago, right after season two ended. I thought the show was incredible, and Brian Cranston's acting was some of the best I've seen anywhere. The problem I had was with the cancer storyline. Three years ago, my father lost a five-year bout with cancer after having beaten it for 10 years prior. This made Breaking Bad too difficult for me to watch purely because the show was so very true to the experience. I have to believe that someone involved with the show, probably the show's creator, had a close experience with a loved one battling cancer. For example, that intervention they have for him to get him to seek treatment seems to be a very true experience. My father was in the exact same state of mind and he went through the exact same things that Walt was afraid would happen to him. So that's what eventually made the show impossible for me to watch. However, from everything I've heard, the show isn't really about cancer anymore. And that's where you come in. Is there a place I can start where he beats the disease and I can start watching without mention of it? Thanks for your help. Keep up the great work, Matt. Uh, now we go to spoiler red because he's asking us for a prescription. Uh, and this was, uh, this is something that I never would have thought of. I mean, this letter really stood out and touched me. And, and uh, I mean, I know what I want to say. What do you say, Tom? I That's a tough one because... I totally understand where Matt's coming from, and I can understand why he doesn't want us, you know, he doesn't want to watch through that really tough part. But I, I hesitate to recommend jumping in because that tough part is an essential building block of everything that follows, even after the disease is less central to the character. And so maybe if he just skips four or five episodes in, there's still stuff involving the hospital and involving treatment uh, that he'd have to go through, but it, it might not be as hard as those first few episodes where it's it's like him freaking out about the disease. What do well, you think? And they, they, they weigh very heavily on the aspects of the cancer thing early on, obviously. Yeah, and it, and, and it underpins your opinion of Walt from then on. Yeah, but I think I think he's got all he needs of that. Um, I I don't know. I would Maybe. say uh, it, it it drops off pretty fast off that storyline after after season two, doesn't it? If you watch the first two seasons, I would say hop in really in the middle of the third season. Just watch the oh, make sure to watch then all you're the missing pieces. so much backstory and so much bonding to the characters. I just I feel like you're doing the story a disservice if you jump but, in that he's late. He's already watched the first two seasons, though, is what he said. What he did. Yeah, yeah, he said, he said, um, let's see. He says, uh, I started watching a couple of years ago right after the season two ended. Yeah, I don't know how far into it he yeah. got. But we will say that that storyline uh, sunsets somewhere near the beginning of season three, right? Yep, pretty much. And and you'll st I'm sure it'll pop up. I'm sure there'll be more interesting things, you know, that that happen with it. But but wow, what a, what an unusual situation to run into. I never, I wouldn't have ever thought of that. Darren writes in, uh, calling himself an aspiring Star Wars nerd. Darren, by calling yourself that, you have achieved it. <laughs> uh, he says. Hello, gents. I'm a lifelong nerd born in 1971, and as such, I was the perfect six-year-old target for Star Wars when it was released to the theaters. I should be the prototypical Star Wars fan. However, I have never seen any of the Star Wars movies, so now I find myself a 40-year-old Star Wars virgin. Other than the obvious parts, I really don't know much of anything about the movies, so this should be a largely unspoiled experience. How do you recommend I watch these films? I can borrow a recent DVD collection of all six movies. Do I watch in theatrical order? or chronological order, or do I bust out my VHS player and just watch the first trilogy from an original release box set that I picked up at a consignment store and forget about anything that came after? This is, this is an important question, Brian. Where do you stand on this? Okay, okay, well, first of all, uh, there's, this is a moral issue here because morally, I know what the answer is. The answer is, if, I, if I'm gonna speak with your best interests at heart, I'm gonna tell you to, to watch the original trilogy first Write us, tell us what you thought of the original t trilogy, then wa watch the prequels and write us and tell you what you thought of the whole experience. That would give you the best experience. But you are, you are an experiment in the making. This is what's amazing. This is a rare opportunity we have. Because I was wondering, what would it be like if somebody tried to watch the movies through chronologically? And I'm convinced that the prequels are so bad that it would ruin your experience of the original trilogy. Um, and I might be totally wrong. So just for experimentation's sake, I want to tell him to watch them in chronological order. But I'm going to tell you, that's the worst way to do it. And I, my hypothesis is that it will ruin the entire experience for you.
It's kind of like donating your body to science. <laughs> Uh, if you feel like you will sacrifice your own well-being for the advancement of knowledge, then I agree with Brian. Watch them, Phantom Menace, then number two, number three, number four, number five, so that we can then do a controlled experiment with your perceptions versus others, because that would be fantastically interesting. However, uh, I do also agree with Brian that the best for you would be to stick to the original, take that VHS tape, uh, ju jump in a uh, rented 1977 Maverick, drive to an <laughs> abandoned movie theater with a projector, uh, and watch it the way it was meant to be watched, as if it were 1977. Then, now wait three years <laughs> to watch Empire Strikes Back. Yes! I That's the only way to replic replicate yeah, yeah. the original. And then experience. go from there. I, I will say this. If you are going to take Tom and Brian's Star Wars challenge. I do ask that you write us a short write-up of your feelings after each movie going through chron chronologically. Because I'd love to know what your questions are, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what you like, what you hate, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, no, I, I, I think it's a very clear answer. I 100% agree with Brian, which is the best way to experience them is original cuts in original order. Uh, but there is a fascinating experiment to be had the other way. Science, bro. Science. It's all for science. Do you want to read Sean's email? Um, yeah, this is a long one, and essentially we covered a lot. He says a lot of really nice things, but this is, yeah, this is from, from, uh, wait, Joe or Sean's? Hang on. Oh, you, you to... take Joe. I'll take Sean then. Okay, all right. Go ahead. Uh, Sean says, I just finished watching episode 35. I was disappointed that you didn't talk about the new Thundercats reboot that started on July 29th. The quality of the animation story and voice acting of the pilot was epic, in my opinion, and I cannot wait until the next episode airs. I was wondering what you thought of it. If you haven't seen it yet, I might have to revoke your child of the 80s license. Strong yeah, words I, uh, from Sean, Brian Brushwood. How do you uh, respond? You know what? I, yeah, yeah, I have no defense. Uh, your Honor... I have no defense, and uh, you're right. I will watch it, and I will get caught up, because I'm telling you, I'm still watching the old ones from the 80s, yeah. and I love them. I, uh, being a child of the 70s, don't have to watch. <laughs> well, you are exempt. You placed out of Thundercats is what you did. That's right. This, uh, we got an email from Joe, and I'm gonna, it's really long. And let me just say one thing real quick. Uh, keep the letters coming. Frameratereshow at gmail.com. Not only your questions, but also your suggestions for stories. That's where some of our best stuff comes up. People say, hey, man saw this, thought of you. We love that stuff and it helps us out tremendously. Um, I will say that if you want us to read your letter and comment on it, tighter, just tighten just a little bit. That's what, all we're trying to say. Um, uh, Joe says, among other things, let me say I was pretty excited for Rise of the Apes. However, in a Hollywood world of remakes and reboots with a lack of original content, I was expecting a letdown of some sort. My God, did this film not disappoint? Being a fan of the first five films, I had my concerns this would be another poor effort on the part of a big studio looking to make a quick buck. It was not. While it has parts of the common plot of Scientist Goes Rogue to find super cure that results in bad juju, the execution sets it apart. Uh, even when the most, and you know, he talks about a bunch of other stuff, but he says, watching Caesar evolve throughout the film was exceptional. Much of the story was told through Caesar's eyes, literally, which is an incredible feat. Not literally, you mean figuratively. Uh, the pinnacle of which was when you see it in his face, the moment he learned to control his emotions, which in contrast, his human co counterparts did not. And that was one of my favorite parts of the movie, was seeing how ape-like you saw the ape in the humans, and you saw the humanity in the apes. Uh, he says a bunch of other stuff. Unfortunately, it's too long, but uh, he says, basically, much like Frame Rate, Rise of the Apes is fantastic. It's the best reboot I've seen since King Kong, and I would certainly agree with that. It's fantastic. Leo was yelling spoiler while you were reading that email. <laughs> it's a little minor spoilage. Huh? We, we, already, we already covered yeah, the spoilage. There's it's no true, spoiler right? alert up on screen. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Spoiler. That's hey, there it. There we go. All right. <laughs> there, you got your yellow. You totally spoiler. ruined the movie for Leo, Brian. <laughs> That's a uh, spoiler alert yellow. You let him apes. know there were apes. That's now yeah, what's he going to do? It's a madhouse. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it for this episode of Frame Rate. You can email us your comments, frameratereshow at gmail.com. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We will see you next time. <laughs> Let's get physical media. Oh, that's disgusting. Yeah, it is pretty disgusting, dude.
Merritt, I've been over these files 8,000 times, and I'm afraid all I've done is write these letters here that mean nothing. Can you explain any of this? What am I supposed to tell corporate, Merritt? Forget it, Brushwood. It's Petaluma. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>